here to talk about prices and prices and auctions in markets with complex constraints. Uh, they told me uh, 30 seconds ago to introduce Paul Milgram, so I have to improvise. But I mean, we will see what, what I can do. So you can read a lot about Paul here. Uh, the, he, he is, he is uh, one of the most cited economists of our time. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's the most cited game theorist of the past 10 years. And uh, the contributions that Paul has, he's most famous for being the leader of the world in auction theory. But if you look at his Google Scholar, you can see that these auction theory papers are not his top papers. In fact, they are not economics papers. They are organization, economics of organizations and finance and theory of the firm, which is part of economics. I was in a conference a couple of years ago, three years ago. Paul, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but <laughs> I was in a conference uh, and Preston McAfee, the chief economist of Microsoft, was giving a talk which was a, which was, which was a hypothetical uh, debate between different people in different fields that if Paul Milgram is going to win the Nobel Prize in the next few years, what field that should be? Because there are so many fields that he can easily uh, be the leader of the world. So uh, we are truly proud to have uh, Paul here. Uh, he was uh, above everything for me. He was uh, the best advisor a PhD student could ever imagine. Uh, there was not a time that I wanted to meet him and he was not available the next day. I think this is something that uh, for someone at the level of Paul who is running the most complex auction uh, in human history is, is, is quite amazing. Thank you, Paul, for coming to Iran and thank you, uh, Mr. Rasami and Pasargat for uh, making this happen. Uh, we are proud to have Paul. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed, for that lovely introduction. I also was very lucky to have had uh, Ron send me some of their best students, and particularly Mohammed here, so it's been a, a mutual admiration society that we've had for a while. Uh, thank you for, for that lovely introduction. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, prices and auctions and markets with complex constraints. That's the title here. It, it's really about markets that need to be centralized for one reason or other. And I want to talk to you about why some markets might need, uh, might need to be centralized, why you wouldn't want them to have them completely uh, uncoordinated. And, and it's related to the idea that there are other constraints that need to be satisfied besides just having supply to demand. Uh, that w or where temporary imbalances in supply and demand are, are really uh, quite unacceptable. So let's, let's get into this. The, the, um, this lecture is written uh, primarily for people with some background in economics. Let me, um, uh, I'm, I'm assuming from what Mohammed has told me that you guys have mixed levels within economics. So let me start off with the question of what a product is. When we run markets, we have markets for a product, but what is a product? Uh, and the classical uh, definition of a product is that it's defined by its physical characteristics and also by its time and place of availability. So for example, uh, if I live in Palo Alto, California, where I do, electricity at 2 o'clock is not the same as electricity at 2.05 when I flip on the light switch at, uh, at 2.05, if there's no power, then it doesn't do me any good to know that there was power five minutes earlier. Uh, they're just not the, uh, the same product. Electricity that's available in the next community is not the same as electricity that's available right here in this community. And uh, so that's an example of where time and space uh, matter in, a lot in the definition of products. For some things, they matter much less. Some things you can afford to wait for. Some things you can cross the street to, to go get the, uh, the other unit of, and they substitute perfectly well. So, uh, so we're going to see some heterogeneity in the importance of time and space and physical characteristics as well in uh, the definition of product. One of the most uh, unsatisfactory, in, in, in my own thinking, notions in, in the definition of uh, product has to do with uh, constraints like space. So when I fly back to San Francisco, uh, the, in the standard economic formulation, I will be using uh, time-space resources. That is, any particular cubic meter of airspace at any particular moment in time 
uh, that is a limited resource. It can only be used once. Um, but my plane, when it's flying through there, no other plane can be flying through there. And uh, if you want to regard uh, the, the resource allocation problem in the world as consisting entirely of just resource constraints, uh, saying that uh, demand should never exceed supply, you could formulate the problem, you could formulate the statement that two planes never crash as being the same as the statement that uh, demand is less than supply in every cubic meter of airspace at every moment in time. But that's a really awkward way to formulate the problem. Nobody in practice does it that way. What we do instead is work with much coarser uh, kinds of products and impose these constraints on the system to guarantee we have air traffic controllers to ensure that uh, flights don't crash. We don't uh, set a price and, and see how many planes show up and see whether the, uh, whether the planes are going to crash. That's just not a good way uh, to run the system. Um, it gets even more complicated when you move uh, further in the class in classic economic theory. Uh, De Bru, uh, chapter seven adds contingencies to the definition of a product. It's not just that uh, that I have a uh, a product of fire extinguisher available. It's that I have a fire extinguisher available when there's a fire. That's uh, the the thing I really care about. And this idea that contingencies are added to the definition of products makes the standard economic formulation the one that we rely on when we say that markets can manage themselves. It makes it a little bit silly for, uh, for some of these applications. So let's, uh, um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm gonna show you some examples where it'll be obvious that, uh, uh, that you can't manage a market this way. And once you don't, once what you do is lump products together, uh, so you have a, a product category that's actually heterogeneous, then it can turn out that it's not enough that, uh, that demand not exceeds supply. You may need the right kind of demand or the right kind of supply, or you may care who gets which resources. I need, when I fly my uh, uh, flight, if, if uh, some time-space resources are allocated in a way that's very general, for example, if, if what's uh, sold are landing slots at an airport, I may nevertheless care a great deal about the, the timing of when the, when the planes land, and I need air traffic controller to coordinate them so that the flights don't crash. Okay, uh, so violating resource constraints, the cost of violating a resource constraint can be much higher than is recognized in classical economic models. Um, you can have plane crashes, you can have brownouts, you have just a little bit too much uh, demand for electricity, your whole system can crash. Uh, so it's not just, as in the standard economic model, that when there's a little <coughs> bit too much demand for supply, a few customers go unserved. Rather, a whole system can be brought down by that in, in some cases. These are other reasons why a market may need, as in the case of electricity, a system operator. Um, even though we're using prices to guide resource allocation, even though we're, uh, we may be buying and selling electricity in forward markets, we may have markets that are, uh, the prices in electricity markets are motivating investments in electrical capacity as it does in uh, some market-oriented systems. We nevertheless still need uh, an operator to ensure that, uh, that these constraints are not violated. Okay, beyond resource uh, um, constraints, the standard assumptions that are incorporated in, in neoclassical economic analysis is, first of all, we focus only on, on resource constraints and static equilibrium uh, that demand not equal supply. And when we look at dynamics, we assume that the only losses that are incurred when demand is, exceeds supply is that some potential user is unserved. And I've given you examples to uh, emphasize for you that these things aren't always true. They're true in some markets but not in all markets, okay? And um, so we sometimes have additional constraints or sometimes the need to match particular versions of a product with particular buyers. So let's talk about some examples. Is everybody able to follow me so far? Am I speaking too fast for you or it's okay? Right? Okay. So um, I remember being alarmed when I first read about the plan to put a spaceport, a uh, front range spaceport. This is an artist's conception. Uh, the architects 
of a new uh, spaceport that was going to be located west of Denver Airport in, in the United States. We are moving into an era when we have not only horizontal flights of or, uh, ordinary aircraft, but also commercial flights uh, launching uh, payloads into orbit and, and even, uh, even ships that can fly into orbit. And these operations are actually quite a bit more dangerous, it seemed to me. Uh, they're novel technology. Right now, uh, planes don't blow up in the mid-air mid very often, but spacecraft sometimes do. And uh, we have to coordinate. The, you, you might not want to have uh, commercial space launches located right next to uh, the largest airport in the mountain states in, in the West. Uh, and why is it proposed to be located there? It's proposed to be located there because it's convenient for the people who are running the spaceport and there's no price that they pay for the uh, extra caution that needs to be taken by commercial aircraft that are flying their horizontal flights. So um, uh, the first time I gave this talk was in, um, was in 2014. It was in a lecture in honor of Ken Arrow. And um, on October 30th, 2014, this is the VSS Enterprise. Um, which was uh, an early commercial spacecraft. The next day, it looked like this. Um, the, uh, it crashed in a test flight over, fortunately, over the Mojave Desert, spreading debris over a 34-mile uh, section of the, uh, of the Mojave Desert. OK, so the, this is simply to emphasize that these things are just quite a bit more dangerous than uh, commercial aircraft. And uh, th there might be a need to separate them perhaps uh, the you know, launching from less populated areas, and perhaps arranging that their times don't overlap the times of, of commercial air flights. These are constraints that need to be imposed on the system. And, uh, and perhaps prices should also play a role in guiding these investments and in saying that the parties have to pay for their externalities somehow, which are not, is not built into the current pricing system. Um, here's another example I want to talk about, again, to emphasize how unique products are. And uh, this is an example I emphasize partly because uh, economists uh, often traditionally refer to something called the Coase Theorem, which, does everybody know what the Coase Theorem is? How many people know what the Coase Theorem is? Oh, just a few, look at that. OK, not so many. And so this is a classic of Chicago economics. Adele is smiling over there. The uh, classic of Chicago economics, markets sort of take care of things on their own. They, you don't have to just use prices. People get to talk to one another. Um, they could, if, if there's something that's good for them, they'll work it out through negotiations. As long as they have property rights, as long as they're able to bargain and buy and sell, according to Cosian analysis, and as long as the transactions costs are low, which means it's easy for them to do these things, to bargain and buy and sell. Um, without you know, incurring huge costs, then you don't have to regulate. The individuals will just take care of these problems on their own. So um, uh, as a test of the Coase theorem and how important it is in reality, uh, a couple of scholars, Hoyt Bleakley and Joe Ferry, wrote a paper in 2014 that studied the allocation of land on the Georgia frontier. This is Georgia, the, the state in the United States, not not the Georgia of, uh, of former Soviet Union. Uh, this is uh, in, in uh, Georgia, the state in the United States. Um, it extends out here, what you don't see here. What, what you do see here is lands that were allocated in the frontier era in the United States. So over here in uh, 1800, I can't even read from here, it looks like 1801. The, uh, some lands that were very near the developed part of the state were uh, allocated to, uh, by lottery to people who wanted to settle those lands. And in 1806 and, and 1820, 21, uh, uh, 27, and 32, lotteries were conducted to assign property rights in all of these lands and say, you know, this belongs to you. Um, you can uh, develop it as you like, and people could apply for lottery. The, re the way this came about is that in the era before that, in the, uh, in the late 18th century, that is in the late 1700s, the, uh, there was a corrupt government in uh, Georgia, and the, uh, 
they were allocating land to their friends, and the population revolted against that and insisted, you know, you're, this isn't fair. We shouldn't allow the government, the governor, just to give land to his friends. So they, uh, the reaction was, we'll allocate land at random. So here's a picture uh, from the uh, a painting from the era uh, that shows a gentleman sticking his arm, or a couple gentlemen sticking their arms into a barrel. You know, you put the I, the numbers of a, a particular piece of land on on paper. You put them in a barrel. You roll the barrel around, and you have people reach in and pull out, and that's how they determine which piece of land is uh, is assigned to them. In this, uh, randomization device from the early uh, 19th century. Okay, so, so that was what was going on. Now what Bleakley and Ferry discovered, um, it, it turns out that the plots of land were sized as appropriate for homesteaders at the time. That is, people would come in and you could build a house and develop land using the technology of that era, but they were relatively small plots of land what a single individual or a single family uh, could develop. And as the technology changed, it became optimal to have larger plots of land to farm and, and develop. And so the question that Bleakley and Ferry asked is, did the market respond? Were people able, just by buying and selling, to, uh, to somehow to make the appropriate transactions take place? And what they found using tax records is that they, they could look at the tax records and see who the owner was on each plot of land. And they found that for roughly 80 years after the plots were allotted, there was hardly any change in ownership. It was very hard for people to make trades and organize the trades to more efficient uh, sizes of lands. They estimated that that cost of, caused about a 20% loss in land value, and that it took about 150 years for the allocation to become unstuck. It's not that people weren't trying and that they didn't eventually uh, make the deals that made uh, that captured the value. It's that when trades are complex, it takes a long time. Now, why are these trades complex? Let's see if we can see a little bit about this. About the uh, oh, by the way, this is some examples of modern examples of land. I'll tell you more about why trades are complex in a moment. This is a development in Seattle, Washington, a shopping center where there was a homeowner who was in the way and didn't want to sell his house. So they designed the shopping center around him, as you can see. Uh, this is a factory in San Antonio, Texas, and here's a church um, that couldn't arrange or didn't want to move. And so they designed the factory and built it around the church. These are obviously very bad outcomes. Uh, the, this home isn't very valuable anymore. There's a lot of wasted space here. This church is, well, you wouldn't want to be uh, going there for your, uh, for your prayer if it's surrounded by a factory. And, uh, and these were problems that emerged because it, it's very hard for individual negotiations for particular plots to work out. There can be things that, that blockade uh, those negotiations. So uh, what's the reallocation challenge? If you imagine that initially um, you have some small plots of land, and you imagine that on account of technical change you want to have larger plots of land, um, what would you do? Well, you'd have to make some trades. Uh, you'd have to, the, the guy who's trying to assemble this plot would need to buy pieces from each of three different landowners, and the guy who wanted this plot would, again, he's got four different pieces that usually originally belonged to four different landowners. In the transition, very many transactions may be required, and fractional transactions along the path to efficiency can temporarily reduce some of the plot sizes and reduce total output. And individual plot owners may have holdout power, as we've seen, that could scuttle a transaction. Actually, I should have put these slides in the other order. The holdout is exactly what I was showing you on the uh, slides before, where individual owners thought maybe if these guys are trying to build a shopping center, I could hold out for a higher price. And they held out for too high a price, and they built the shopping center around it. OK. So um, I want to tell you next about something that's going on right now, the FCC incentive auction. Um, this is, uh, I was the principal designer of the FCC incentive auction. I put together the team that did this work. Um, and it's an attempt to take 
to reallocate radio spectrum um, from use in television broadcast into use in mobile broadband, the kind of devices we all carry in our pockets. So uh, wh what's the story behind this? Let's see, I think I have some of this on the, uh, on the slide. There are about 2,200 television broadcasters in the UHF band in the United States and about 800 more in Canada. Um, they currently use uh, broadcast channels 14 to 36 and 38 to 51 broadcast television. The about 90% of viewers use cable or satellite, at least as of 2012 when I did this slide. Uh, about 90% of consumers in the United States were uh, using cable or, or satellite, and only 10% were using um, over-the-air broadcast to receive their signals. And uh, moreover, the, the, we, you don't need as much spectrum anymore to broadcast a TV signal either, because the shift to digital broadcasting allows these stations to multiplex, that is to send several television signals using a single uh, channel. So the, the use of spectrum for TV broadcasting has fallen. At the same time, the use of spectrum for mobile broadband, for iPhones and Androids, the devices that we all carry around, that's become, that's grown a lot. Uh, it's grown exponentially. It's growing at very rapid rates. Uh, both the, the demand for it and the value of the spectrum. And most of the useful low-frequency low spectrum, in fact, all of the useful low-frequency uh, uh, low spectrum is already in use. So what we have to do is get some people to give up the uh, spectrum that they're using in order to move it to a new use. So this is classic market. Sad Ali over there would recognize, I'm waking you up here, they would recognize this is, what do we need anything for? This is just... Somebody has an asset which is more valuable in another use. Let the market solve it. Well, why can't the market solve it? Well, the plan is basically to transition to get the, some of these frequencies from the low value use to the higher value uses to provide a cash in incentive for broadcasters to relinquish the spectrum, to have a market determine how many channels will go in the transition, and to have a net positive revenue for the government. Uh, I want to indicate this picture, which must look strange to you when you first glance at it. This picture is supposed to show you how complicated this problem is. Begin to show you. So um, right in the center of the picture, you'll see a little pink dot. There's a bunch of pink dots, but there's one right in the middle. That's a TV station somewhere in New York City. And um, you see a bunch of other, you, you see lots of dots. Some of them are white and some of them are pink. Those represent the locations of other TV stations. And you see uh, arcs, that is lines, connecting pairs of dots. Those lines connect a pair of dots if, were I to assign them to the same channel, so you broadcast on channel 15 and you also broadcast on channel 15, there would be interference. Uh, you're too close to each other or somebody who is trying to receive the broadcast would uh, have interference between the two signals. So these... Uh, all, each of these arcs in the graph, that is, each line represents a potential interference constraint. All the pink uh, dots in here are ones that are connected to that dot. That is, they're all the ones that can't share a channel. And the white ones that you see out here are ones that are connected to something that are connected to the uh, central dot. Okay, so we have a, a pattern of interference constraints. And our problem, instead of out reallocating <laughs> radio spectrum, uh, to satisfy new constraints is to uh, reallocate uh, TV channels covering the entire United States. So this is the interference graph. I showed it to you around in detail around one station in New York. This is the interference graph for the entire United States um, showing all of the potential interference between television stations. There are about 130,000 uh, of these uh, arcs, that is interference constraints that say two stations can't be assigned to the same channel. And that's a simplification. The actual problem is more complicated than that because whether or not two stations can be assigned to the same channel sometimes depends on which channel it is. And the channels that are available uh, depend on whether we're near the Canadian border or not, where that channel is claimed by Canada, or near the Mexican border, where some of the channels are claimed by Mexico. And uh, you know, there are other 
some, some channels, some TV stations can't be within, not only can't be on the same channel, but can't be on adjacent channels. So there's a, a large number of, uh, of constraints. And if you list them all out to recognize the detail and just list them channel by channel, we get uh, 2.7 million constraints. So this is a very hard resource allocation problem. We have to, uh, when we assign channels to TV stations, we have to um, uh, satisfy 2.7 million constraints, okay? So in order for the assignment to be feasible. So that's a large scale complicated problem. And um, in, in its, in its uh, original form, the form I showed you with just, just the links, it's what um, computer scientists and engineers call a, gra and mathematicians call a graph coloring problem. Um, how many people know what a graph coloring problem is? Oh, fraction of you, okay. So let me do for the rest of you. Um, so the, we have a bunch of uh, TV stations and interference constraints. That are, they're nodes and arcs. The whole thing is represented as a graph. They're nodes, which are the TV stations, and arcs, which are pairs of TV stations that can't be assigned to the same channel. And uh, the typical graph coloring problem says, given a set of colors and given a graph, is it possible to assign a color to each node of the graph so that no two connected nodes are the same color? Okay, so in our problem, if you just look at the, the simple constraints, it says, given a, a set of channels and a set of TV stations, is it possible to assign a, a, a channel to each TV station so that no two connected TV stations are on the same channel? Okay, that's just, is it possible to find a way to assign a collection of TV stations uh, channels so that we don't create interference? Now, that is um, what's called an NP-complete problem, and I'm going to guess that the same people who knew what graph coloring is know what NP-completeness is, and the rest of you don't. Um, so I will tell you it's a really hard problem. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's a problem that, um, to simplify slightly, if you do it at scale in and you look for the worst-case problem, worst-case graph coloring problem, and for any algorithm that you may specify, there is uh, some problem of size k whose runtime under that algorithm is an exponential function of k. That's roughly speaking what it means to be NP-complete. For the computer scientists, I would say if p is not equal to NP and uh, all that stuff, the, uh, but the basic, anyway, I, uh, for the rest of you, basically this is a problem that, that there don't exist any algorithms. I, what I can safely say is there don't exist any algorithms that always solve this pro these problems fast, okay, in the worst case. Now, that doesn't mean that the average cases are hard. You can have uh, 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 things that seem to run well most of the time if you're lucky, and uh, we're going to investigate that uh, in a little bit. Actually, I'm not going to say that much about that. I, I, so I guess since I'm not going to say that much about that, so this is part of a, okay. part of what my team did is uh, investigate algorithms for the graph coloring problem. Why is this so important to us when we try to buy TV stations? Suppose these guys in the front row own TV stations, and I say, great, I can buy those. They're willing to sell. These guys in the back two rows, they're not willing to sell. Um, is, that, is it enough for me to buy the guys in the front rows? Is there any way to assign these guys who want to continue to broadcast, is there any way to assign channels to each of them so that that's feasible, that's not interfering? If the answer is yes, that means that I can accept the bids that the, the, the offers these guys have made by their TV stations and have a, a feasible allocation of channels. If the answer is no, that means I have to get one of these guys, at least one of them, to sell me their station too for me to be able to, uh, 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 to solve this problem. So during an auction, and we're going to keep track during the auction in real time of what's feasible and what's not, um, we, we are going to try to buy a collection of stations that makes it possible for us to uh, take the losing bidders, the people who wouldn't sell, and assign them uh, channels in a feasible way. Uh, this is uh, uh, the most complicated resource allocation problem in history to be done by an auction. It's uh, uh, nothing of this complexity could have been done a few years ago. 
and uh, we have new algorithms to help make help do this pretty well. But I won't be talking about those today. Instead, I want to talk about the general lessons for economic theory uh, that I've been reflecting on having built the incentive auction. And um, uh, I've, been, I've been working, as we build this market, I've been working with engineers. We're trying to do things that actually work, as opposed to things, you know, the economists mostly look at things in the abstract. They say, well, you know, you have prices. They guide the resource allocation. Uh, they don't say, will the planes crash? That's what the engineers look at. Uh, and, but we have to design a market that actually works. And, uh, and I want to know whether there are any lessons that come from respecting the engineering constraints uh, when there's actual heterogeneity in the, uh, in the products. That is, when the goods that I'm getting are not really the same. And maybe I can't find exact market clearing prices when the assumptions that guide standard economics fail. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with an, what I think of as an in-between model, um, a model that isn't quite as complex as what uh, engineers would use if they were trying to model O'Hara Airport, but is more complex than what most economists use, and try to begin to understand what the role of prices is and the role of a central coordinator and whether prices could clear a market when we have a complex resource allocation problem and what happens when they don't. So um, this, is a, this is the problem I'm going to study now. How many people know the knapsack problem? So again, a fraction of you. All right, half maybe. So this is the knapsack problem, very simple problem. Uh, we imagine you have a knapsack problem, a, a knapsack that's a, a package, if you will, a box, if you will, of size S bar. That's how big it is. And you've got items that are labeled from one through each item has some value, Vn, which is positive, and has some size, Sn, which is positive. And in each case, you decide whether to include the item or not. Xn is 1 if the item goes in the knapsack, and it's 0 if the item doesn't go in the knapsack. And your problem is to choose which items go in the knapsack, that is to maximize by choice of x, uh, the sum of Vn times Xn, so you get the value if the item goes in, and you get nothing from that item if it doesn't go in. So we're maximizing its value, subject to the constraint that the total sizes of the items that you put in is no bigger than the knapsack, okay? than the capacity of the knapsack. So we're trying to land planes at O'Hare Airport, and maybe we have an overall uh, a number of passengers that we could handle, and the planes have different numbers of passengers on them. And we're trying to maximize the value of the throughput through the airport subject to the constraint that um, we have a capacity constraint at the airport. So the class of knapsack problems, part of the reason I've selected this is that uh, this is an NP hard, an NP complete problem. That is, if you give me an allocation and say, well, I'm going to take this flight and that flight and that flight, and that's the optimum, and you ask a computer scientist, check for me whether that's really the optimum. Okay? That's an NP-complete problem, which is to say that for any algorithm he uses to check that, you can find examples of problems that'll take him a really long time, uh, an amount of time that grows exponentially in the number of items that, uh, that we're considering. Okay? Um, so it's in principle a hard problem, but in practice, Actually, if you're willing to settle for an approximate optimum, it's not that hard at all, and that's what we're going to come to next. So uh, George Danzig, uh, one of the inventor of, of linear programming and the simplex method, a very famous operations researcher, um, in the 1950s uh, described the use of an algorithm to approach problems like this that he called the greedy algorithm. And the way the greedy algorithm works is you take the items and you, put, you rank them well, let's call the first, let's make item one the item that has the highest value per size ratio. So we take a look at you know, its value in euros per cubic meter, and it's the highest one, and then the second highest one down to the last one, which has the lowest value in terms of size per cubic meter. And then what, we run this algorithm, and this is the algorithm. It's very, what this says, I'll just say it in words. You can, those of you who prefer the math can read it. What it says is, you take the first item. If it fits in the knapsack, you put it there. 
If it doesn't fit, fit, you set it aside, you go to the second item. If, if you have enough space to put it in the knapsack, given what's already there, you put it in. Otherwise, you set it aside and just continue. So you just, it's greedy in the sense that you just take the items in this order. You put them in if you can, and you set them aside if you can't. And when you're done, you have a packing. So, I mean, you know, suppose you're going on vacation this weekend, and, and you're getting ready to pack your car, and so some things you want to take, and they're of rel different relative importance. You know, this would be a pretty good way to decide what to put in the trunk, right? Of your car, you'd say, yeah, take the thing that's most valuable, unless it's too big. So let's take a look at value per size. And just stick in the most valuable stuff. That comes pretty close to being optimal. Um, and basically, Danzig's paper talked about how close it is. I'm going to skip that part of the analysis for now. But he showed that this does pretty well. And um, for the analysis I'm going to do, I want you to think of the uh, solution, the set of things I select this way, as being a function of the values, the vector of values, and the vector of sizes. It's the set of things that I choose to put in the knapsack when I go through this algorithm. Uh, alpha super greedy when I go through the greedy algorithm. Now, this function, alpha, has a property that is a kind of monotonicity property. It's what economists call monotonic for a mechanism, but it's not, I, I, I need to define it for you because it's not the standard monotonicity of functions that you're familiar with. Um, so what it means for, a, for an algorithm of this sort to be monotonic is, that if some item gets into the knapsack, say item 7 gets into the knapsack, if you were to increase its value, it would still get into the knapsack. Okay, that's a property that this algorithm has. And why is that? Well, if, you, if it starts in seventh position and um, you increase its value, at worst it's still going to be in seventh position. Maybe it'll be in a higher position. And if there was room for it, um, you know, given the items that came before, there's still going to be room for it. And if it comes up earlier, there's, it's even more likely that there'll be room for it. So the, uh, uh, when you make the item more valuable, it's uh, more likely to fit into the knapsack. It continues to be selected. Now, this kind of monotonicity is important because it's a necessary and sufficient condition for something, which we're about to talk about. Um, actually, I think I will skip to, the, to here and then circle around. There's a paper by uh, Lehman, Callahan, and Shoham in 2002, which says, suppose that the items are each owned by separate individuals who are bidders. So each plane is landing at the airport has a separate owner, suppose. And suppose the sizes are observable to the auctioneer, but the values are not. So what they say, well, ask each bidder to tell you its value. Uh, so Mohammed, tell me how much your, your item is worth. And I collect those values, and I run the greedy algorithm. And then I charge you for the space in the knapsack. And here's the price I charge you. The price I charge Mohammed for his item in the knapsack is I, it, it's going to be a function of everybody else's value and the vector of sizes. And it's the lowest value that would have resulted in Mohammed being in the knapsack. Now, remember, this algorithm is monotonic. So for any value above this value, the item will be in the knapsack. And for any value below this value, the item will not be in the knapsack. This is the lowest amount that Mohammed could have bid and gotten his item into the knapsack. And I claim that if I set the prices this way, then this auction is what we call truthful. It means that it's in everybody's interest to report truthfully. When I say, how much is your item worth? If it's his item is worth 10, the best he can do is tell me my item is worth 10. Why is that? Well, he can't affect the price anyway. The price doesn't depend on the value that he reports to me. So when Muhammad says that his, his uh, value is 10, I'm going to do my calculation and I discover his threshold price is 9. That means I should put him in the knapsack for any value higher than 9. He reported 10, so he goes into the knapsack. He pays a price of 9. Could he have benefited by lying? Well, if he'd said the, his value was 11, wouldn't have changed anything. He'd still get in. He'd still get the price of 9. Uh, if he'd said his price was 7, he wouldn't have gotten in. And he's unhappy about that because it's worth 10 to him, and he's only paying 9. 
He can, he can never do better than to report truthfully if I set things this way. And by the way, the reason I emphasize monotonicity is that um, this formula works for any monotonic algorithm. And a mechanism is truthful if and only if the, uh, uh, the underlying allocation mechanism has this monotonicity property that I've just described to you. I won't prove that, but it's true. OK. Now, um, so this is, this is an example of how you can use an auction to allocate spaces in a particular way. Now, I, what I want to tell you next, I want to go back. And I, I want to tell you that the, this auction that I've described to you, I described to you a sealed bid mechanism, which I just asked the value. This can also be run as, an, as a, a clock auction in the following way. I could, I, I could run the same algorithm by saying, I'm going to start with some really high price. And I'm going to lower that price gradually and say, who would like to be in, the, uh, in my knapsack at this price? Who would like to be at the next price? I, I, I lower the price gradually. And um, I stop. Uh, so and suppose that Mohammed, I, the price gets to, uh, uh, to 10. And Mohammed says, yes, I'd, uh, I'd be happy to go in at a price of 10. And now suppose that uh, uh, for Sayyid Ali, there's no longer any room for his item. So I don't lower it. I freeze his price. His price remains 10. He said he doesn't want it to go in at a price of 10. And I continue lowering the price. I, I offer 9, 8, 7. Uh, and some people say they want to go in. If there's space for them, I put them in. If there's no space for them, I stop lowering their price. And I continue um, in that fashion. Now, uh, what does that do? Uh, it obviously selects exactly the same set of items to go in. The guy who has the highest value uh, per unit of space, he accepts the price of 10. So I'm going to take him. As the price continues to go down, uh, the, uh, the next guy who goes in is the next highest value per unit of space. I'm going to select exactly the same people. Um, I say nearly the same because this is but for discreteness. I'm, I, I'm ignoring the price increments when I do this. Uh, but for discreteness, this leads to exactly the same outcome as the greedy algorithm. And because it leads for exactly the same outcome for the greedy algorithm, it also has the property that the price that I generate along the way, so um, I, I can use threshold pricing. I, continue, I can continue to, um, uh, to lower prices, and I can, get, uh, I can get a dominant strategy mechanism in which people will bid in a straightforward way by lowering uh, uh, by lowering prices in, uh, in an appropriate way. OK, so greedy algorithms have been studied by engineers what they, uh, uh, and computer scientists. What they usually ignore, well, when economists look at these problems, they care about if, if we were to set prices this way, uh, would it provide appropriate investment incentives? Now, for those of you who have studied economics in the standard model, what am I doing on time, by the way? Okay. Um, in, this, in the standard model, we, um, we, we think that uh, individuals get appropriate incentives for investments when, we, when what we pay for investments is the marginal return. We say, you know, if space at the margin is worth uh, $5 a unit, and we pay people $5 a unit for their investments, that that should lead to an efficient, uh, uh, an efficient allocation subject to the usual assumptions that go into an economic model. But that's, that doesn't work in the knapsack problem. Let me give you a, a sense of why. Suppose, for example, that um, I, I might as well do this in general for a technical audience. So if you were to plot the value of the items I can fit into the knapsack at the optimum as a function of the size of the knapsack, just if you were just to plot it, you'd have a step function. It would go along for a while. Uh, then when you had enough space, you'd find a, a, another way to reorganize things and to create more value. So you'd create some other combination. Go along for a while, and you'd put something else. And it would be a non-decreasing step function. Uh, it would be continuous um, from the right. As you, come, uh, as you go from the left, there are jumps. Okay? And that means that at every point, uh, this step function has a derivative from the right. There is some marginal value of additional space. And at every point, that, that right-hand derivative is 0. The marginal value of additional space is always 0. 
Well, if you set a zero price for space, you aren't going to get any investment in space. So you're always going to get an inefficient investment if you set the price that you offer uh, for additional space to be equal to the marginal value of that space. So what I want to know is if we set prices this way, as the way that the LOS mechanism proposes, what will happen to uh, the investments? Suppose that by investing, I can make my item a little smaller. I can take a, a, a up less runway space or use less terminal space, spend less time hooked to the terminal so that more gates are available, whatever it is. Uh, suppose that by investing, I can make my item a little smaller. Um, by investing a cost of C, I can reduce the size of my item um, by delta. Well, it's going to turn out that the incentives that, the amount of incentives that people will make will turn out to be excessive in this case. And you can see why. Uh, as I've already explained to you, the marginal value of a little bit of investment is always zero. And once we get to the optimal level, if I, however I set prices, uh, if I'm offering any positive price for additional investment, I'm going to get some, uh, some excessive investment made. And the examples here, um, which I won't go over for you, show that uh, the amount of investments is, uh, that you get from the LOS mechanism is always excessive. It sets a positive price of space. It compensates. Uh, it's nice. It creates some space. It's better than setting a price of zero. But at the margin, uh, we're getting some, some space investment that we're not going to use that's wasted investment. Here's a, another greedy algorithm that you can run um, that works exactly the same way as the old greedy algorithm, except that as soon as some item doesn't fit, you stop. This is a worse greedy algorithm than the, uh, than the one that LLS worked with and that uh, Danzig had. Uh, you start, you put in the most valuable item, and then if there's space, you put in the next most valuable item, and so on. But as soon as you find an item that doesn't fit, you set, and, and set it aside, you stop. In the Danzig algorithm, you, you keep looking, because there might be some other things you can fit in there, and that's going to do better, right? But um, this algorithm has the nice property that um, its, um, its threshold price, the price that you have to pay, uh, that, that you pay people is exactly proportional to the size of the item. It generates a price per unit of space, which is the value of the first item that you set aside divided by its size. So if the first guy to be excluded had a value of 15 and a size of 3, um, then I set the price per unit of space at 5, and I charge everybody 5 times the amount of space uh, that they were using. And this looks like a standard market, and I begin to see how resource allocation can be done with standard prices. This is uh, resource allocation using a uniform price is going to be less efficient than the greedy algorithm. For the reasons I described, there could be some small plane that I could have put in in addition to this planes that are already landing. Um, but he's priced out of the market because this price is too high for him. And that's what this algorithm uh, does. Now I'm going to call um, the value that I get from this algorithm uh, V alt. And the theorem that I have is this mechanism is truthful. So this is still a greedy algorithm. I'm still setting a threshold price. This mechanism is still monotonic in the same sense that I described before. Um, and, and so it's still going to be in your interest to behave in a truthful, straightforward way. Moreover, uh, if you ask how it does, well, it doesn't do as well as the greedy algorithm. The value it gets is less than the value of the greedy algorithm. But it's more than the value of the optimum minus something that's observable. Okay, so if we take what's observable over here is you ask, how far from the optimum might you be? You take a look at the amount of empty space that results from running this algorithm. And you multiply it by the price of space. You say, that's, the, that's an upper bound on how much waste I have compared to the optimum when I run this algorithm. So if I'm filling up my knapsack and I have a uh, two cubic meters of space left over that's empty, as a result of running this algorithm. And if my price per unit of space is 7, uh, then I have lost, a, I'm within 14 of the optimum, 7 times 2. OK, that's what this, uh, what this algorithm achieves. Moreover, 
even if you uh, consider what happens when investments go on, I get the same bound. I get a bound. So what's what this, uh, I, I'm not going to go over all the detail of this either for lack of time, but what I've studied here is I've imagined that each uh, individual uh, item owner is deciding based on this pricing how much to invest. It says, well, the price is, if the price is, uh, uh, you know, is seven and the, uh, uh, and I can make my item a little smaller, I figure out whether it's worth my while to make the item smaller, take me into a account the price and now I the, the people affect the sizes of their items they then run through the algorithm they pay the price that comes out of this algorithm and I ask how well did I do taking not only the packing inefficiency into account but the investment inefficiency as well and what this says is that the amount I lose compared to the optimum when the sizes of the items are chosen optimally by the individual participants given the prices uh, given the costs that are um, uh, that they face, so they they uh, they spend the optimal amount individually to affect the size of their item. How much did I lose from this whole decentralized system with pricing? Well, it's bounded in the same way by the amount of empty space times the price. And so, why do I get the same bound even when I'm considering investment and not just packing efficiency? It's actually very simple and intuitive. Um, suppose that uh, suppose that you invest too much, and um, we know that there's this incentive to invest even when there's no return, even when it doesn't affect the optimum. So you invest too much, and you save a unit of space. Okay, so uh, you wasted that money. How much money might you have spent when you got that unit of space? Well, if the price is seven, and since you were optimizing. Um, you, to create that extra unit of space, your, your cost couldn't have been more than seven. It had to be less than seven, or it wouldn't have been in your interest to do that. So, the, uh, uh, so it's true that you've invested too much. You've added one unit to the empty space. I get to observe the empty space, so this is an observable bound. Um, and I know that uh, there's one more unit of empty space. I know that the price is seven. I know that the amount of investment you wasted has to be less than seven, in this example it was six. So this thing bounds not only the inefficiency from packing, but also the inefficiency from investment added some together. So we begin to see how a, a, a price system can work uh, in a market where there is a, um, it's NP complete, we can't actually calculate the optimum, we can't actually verify the optimum, but we can observably bound how far away you are from the optimum. And we can um, uh, and we can provide decent investment incentives at the same time when setting the uh, invest when setting the price equal to the marginal value of space doesn't work at all. All right. Um, now there's a couple of different greedy algorithms that uh, that I want to talk about briefly. I've already talked to you about the LOS algorithm, which is the algorithm where you select winners by a greedy algorithm. And the other bidders are the losers. In a descending clock auction, what I do is I select, uh, in the auction I'm going to describe to you, is I'm going to select losers by the greedy algorithm. And the guys who are left over are the winners. When you use a greedy algorithm, you're basically sorting things into two groups, those that go in and those that stay out. And when I, when I run the auction for uh, the FCC, for radio spectrum, what I'm going to do in my auction is um, I'm going to start offering high prices to buy spectrum, to buy stations. And uh, I set a high price, and I have more offers than I need. So I, I decide, you know what, I don't need your uh, TV station to clear the spectrum. So I lower the price to you. And uh, at some point, you say no. You don't want to uh, be in. So I, I say, I have to find a channel for you. Um, fine. I continue lowering prices to I lower price to you. I have to find, uh, if you say no, I'm not willing to accept that price, I have to find a channel for you. So you guys, the guys who have rejected my offers, the guys who are the losing bidders in the auction, are the ones that I have to pack into the available space in the radio spectrum. So what I'm going to do is I have a packing problem where I have to pack the losers into the available space in the radio spectrum, the guys who don't win the auction. And, uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a high price and continue to lower it. 
and I'll lower it as long as there's space. And when I come to you and I discover, um, gee, uh, before I lower your price, I say, do I have room to give her a channel? I'm going to check feasibility and discover I'm giving him a channel and I'm giving him a channel and you're sitting right between those two guys. And uh, uh, if I only have two channels available, um, there's no way I can give you a channel. You're too close to her. Your, your broadcast would interfere with her if you were on her channel. And you're too close to him. Your broadcast would interfere with him if you were on his channel. I can't give you a channel. I'm going to stop lowering your price and I'm going to buy your TV station from you at the last price that I offered. That's how my auction is going to work. Okay. So um, these two categories of whether I select winners or losers are economically distinct because it's the winning bidders who I pay and the losing bidders who I don't. And this descending clock auction is what we're running to buy radio stations, to buy television stations for the US Federal Communications Commission. Okay. So um, I, want to, I want to spend a few minutes to tell you how well this works. Because it works really well. It works so well that it's, um, it's puzzling to us how well it works. Okay? So um, let me just, so here's, here's how we, it turns out that this problem, uh, the problem of computing the optimal, if, if I knew the values of all the TV stations and you asked me, Compute the optimum. Find the, the set of TV stations that are most valuable to leave on the air and the set of stations that are least valuable that you could take off the air. And you asked me to compute that? Well, we tried to solve that problem five years ago. Uh, we ran some simulations, estimated values, tried to run an optimization with the best available commercial software. This problem is too hard. We couldn't solve it. The, we let the computer run for weeks. It was not making very much progress anymore after a couple, in fact, after the first day, it made hardly any progress at all. We let it run for two weeks more, made hardly any progress at all. It didn't find the optimum um, for the uh, value, uh, for, for putting values in the stations. This is a really hard computational problem. So in order to test how well a heuristic, like a greedy algorithm works, we decided to try a smaller problem. We took this area of the United States over here, which is basically New York City, and it's the region around it, more or less. Uh, so we took New York City and the region around it. It looks, the, the constraints look like this around New York City. There's 218 stations in there, much less than the 2,200. About a tenth of the stations in the US are in that region. We decided we were going to buy enough stations to try to clear 126 megahertz of spectrum. That meant that we would have, what channels, 14 to 30, we would have 17 channels available to try to assign uh, stations to. And uh, we created values for those stations by sampling from some published uh, data that's supposed to estimate station values just to create a, a good simulation. And we gave our feasibility checker, the thing that looked, the thing that tries to solve these these NP complete problems, we gave it a one minute timeout and said each time you have a minute to find a feasible solution. If you can't find a, a place to pack her station after a minute, we're going to assume there isn't any place to pack her station and we're going to just buy it. Okay? So, uh, so that's the, uh, how we ran this simulation. And here's what happened. Okay? So we ran. Um, so to, the, the calculation of the optimum, and you guys have been lectured to about VCG already. Have they gotten a lecture on VCG? Yes? yes. Yeah, OK. So, uh, so we, we ran the Vickery clark Groves mechanism on this problem. And we want to compare it to the, uh, uh, the, the auction I've just described to you. And um, we also wondered how important it was to make the advances we made in feasibility checking. So, uh, what we did is, uh, every time we ran a Vickery clark Groves mechanism, it turned out that to calculate the optimum and to calculate the prices for each run of the Vickery clark Groves mechanism was 85 hours of computer time on this small problem. It's a, this problem is a tenth the size of the real problem, and it took 85 hours of computer time. But this problem was small enough that we could actually calculate the optimum. Um, so, uh, so we've managed to run half a dozen of these. It took a lot of computer time. And, um, and then we ran um, 
our auction using the algorithm I described to you. And uh, the average run took seven minutes, so it's much faster, much less compute intensive. And you might think, you know, you couldn't possibly hope to do as well as actual optimization. So what I have on uh, this axis is the efficiency loss that we get from using uh, the algorithm. And what I have on this axis is how the cost compares to the cost of buying stations under the Vickery clark rose mechanism. And what I want to do is I want to focus on three distinct regions. Over here um, is the region where uh, we, there are various variations that are built into this region. But a lot, in this region, all of the runs are runs that are done without our fancy feasibility checker. We've done a lot of work on improving, uh, checking, essentially solving this graph coloring problem, uh, checking whether, uh, whether there's any way to assign stations. And you can see it's way over to, to the right and way up from everything else. That means if we didn't have a good feasibility checker, uh, we'd have efficiency losses on the order of 30% and cost increases on the order of 50% compared to the Vickery auction. Much worse performance than the Vickery auction. But that's with the bad, uh, with the out of the box feasibility checker. With the actual feasibility check we're, we're using, we're doing much better. Second set of points I want to point out to you is what happens when we just run flat out against the Vickery auction. So we just, uh, we just run using our, our, these are the blue points, using our good feasibility checker, just running it the way I've described to you. And we find that our efficiency losses are pretty small, and our uh, cost losses are pretty small. They, we usually, our costs are pretty close to the victory cost most of the time. They sometimes get up a little higher. Um, the efficiency losses are all less than 5%, averaging somewhere in the neighborhood of 2%. Uh, despite the fact that we're running in seven minutes instead of 85 hours. So this is a, uh, uh, you know, an incredibly effective heuristic on, uh, on this problem. And this third set of points that I want to point out to you are these down here. Okay, and I haven't talked to you about uh, this part of the auction design. But in designing this auction, we decided, you know, what's really costing us a lot of money um, is the, that we have to pay a lot of money to buy some stations that aren't worth very much because they don't cover uh, very many people. Um, they don't serve very many people. We know they're not worth very much to their owners. We're paying them just the same as if uh, a uniform price, just the same as they're worth what any other station is worth. And we'd like to be able to pay higher prices to the big station owners so we can buy some of those too, but that would drive our costs to the roof. So why don't, why don't we pretend that the volumes of the station are related to their population? So we used square root of population covered uh, as a volume measure uh, in running the greedy algorithm I described to you. Remember I had size in the denominator before? Now I want you to imagine we put square root of population in the denominator as if it were size. Uh, this is just so that we will end up offering a lower price to the stations that cover uh, uh, fewer customers and a higher price to the stations that cover uh, more customers. And when we did that, our efficiency losses went up a little bit. Uh, some, some of them worked out pretty well. Sometimes we had some additional efficiency loss. But you'll notice that the costs, you know, it looked, uh, on average, the costs are about 40% lower. Well, no, I'm sorry, about 30% lower when we did this than they would have been in the flat out auction. So we were able to bring the cost of the auction in our simulations down by about 30% by making the kind of correction that I uh, just described to you. So uh, this was really uh, very impressive, uh, in, in our view, very impressive performance for the uh, example. By the way, Mohammed, the, what's different between this and what I showed you in Chicago, at the University of Chicago, I showed you numbers that were even more impressive than these. Um, and the question is, what goes in the denominator here? When we looked at efficiency losses, part of the problem, it turns out that in the computer science literature, when they want to talk about how well a greedy algorithm works, they look at the optimal value that goes into the, uh, into the knapsack. And they look at the value you get, let's say, from the greedy algorithm. 
And you divide that by the optimal value that goes into the knapsack, and that's your measure of how close you came. If I did that, these numbers would look way better. Everything would be less than 1% of efficiency losses. And the reason is that the stations that stay on the air are in, in our auction are the high value stations, they're the ones who refuse to sell. And if we use them in the denominator for fig figuring out what value we put on the air, uh, you know, uh, how much loss there is from not putting the best stations on the air, and then divide by the value the stations go on the air, we have an enormous denominator, and we get very small efficiency losses. What we decided to do instead to measure efficiency is you can take a look at the value of the stations that we buy um, and say, how close does that come to minimizing the value of the stations? So the ones who are left over. And that gives us a much smaller denominator, one on the order of a tenth the size. So we get a, the, the numbers that I'm reporting here are about 10 times larger in terms of the, uh, I'm trying to be honest about what's a good measure of the efficiency loss. Um, here, the, the, uh, these numbers are about 10 times larger than the alternate measure. So had I measured it the other way, or more than 10 times larger, had I measured it the other way, I would be showing efficiency losses of less than 1%, which is what you saw in Chicago until I decided that wasn't a reasonable way to, uh, uh, to measure efficiency losses. OK. So it's 3.38, and what I'm not going to do is, um, is tell you guys about Matroid theory. Um, the, um, let me just skip past a bunch of this stuff and show you something else instead. Okay, and we won't do the substitution index either. Instead, I'm just going to want to say a few words about what's happening right now. So this auction that I described to you is running. Um, and. Um, one of the things we have to do in this auction is figure out how much spectrum to clear. So the way we're, you, how many stations should we buy? How many uh, licenses should we sell? It depends how much the uh, broadband guys are willing to pay for spectrum and what price the sellers are demanding for their stations. If they're, uh, if they're demanding very high prices, we should be uh, transacting less. Uh, if the guys are willing to pay very high prices to buy the station, we should be transacting more. So the way this auction runs is we start by setting, let's see if I actually have it here. The way the auction runs conceptually is like this. The, we start by setting a very high quantity target. And you have to imagine that in the background somewhere there are actually are supply and demand curves. And um, we then start reducing the price in the reverse auction to buy TV stations. And we start raising the price in the forward auction to sell broadband licenses. And they go like that. And oops, we've been too ambitious in our clearing target. The price that we're paying to buy spectrum is more than the price that we're getting to sell spectrum. We're incurring a loss. So what we do is we reduce the quantity target and say, OK, we can't clear 126 megahertz. Let's try for 114 megahertz. Um, and then we let the price continue to fall in the reverse auction and continue to rise in the forward auction. And oops, if this is the way it goes, that's still not good enough. So we say, well, we've got to uh, reduce the target again and let the price continue to fall in the reverse auction and continue to rise in the forward auction until we're getting enough revenue in the forward auction to cover the cost of the reverse auction. This is a version of what uh, used to be called Marshallian dynamics uh, in the very old economics uh, uh, about how markets might reach clearing, but it's being done with heterogeneous commodities, uh, so it's, it's novel in, uh, in that sense. So this is the way the auction is, is supposed to work, and what I want to do to close up here is uh, this is where the auction currently is. Uh, we started by setting 120 megahertz uh, clearing target, and at 126 megahertz, the, um, the total cost, where is it? The total cost to buy the spectrum would be $88.379 billion. Okay, that's how much the, uh, the broadcasters wanted for their spectrum in the reverse auction. The amount that the broadband providers were willing to pay was uh, $23 billion, way less. Okay, so we moved on and we reduced 
the clearing target from 126 megahertz to 114 megahertz of, uh, that's how much we're buying from TV stations, and how much we're selling in mobile broadband licenses is 90 megahertz. I haven't described to you the engineering of the radio spectrum, but the, uh, you have to have guard bands, you have, you have, you have to, uh, between the TV stations, where the TV stations are and where the mobile broadband providers are, there has to be empty spectrum so that the mobile broadband uses don't interfere with the TV uses. And between uplink and downlink, there's anyway, there's a bunch of, uh, in this case, uh, it looks like 24 megahertz of, uh, of spectrum actually has to be allocated into guard bands to engineer the spectrum that way. So um, that's what we got. Um, we're way short. And we are now moving into the second stage with the lower clearing target. And that will uh, resume on September 13th, just what's today. Today is uh, the fourth, so in nine days, the, um, uh, the auction will resume. And prices will continue to fall in the reverse auction and continue to rise in the forward auction until we eventually uh, get this clearing. OK? So again, that was how this worked. And that's pretty much what I got to tell you today, I think. So thank you very much. Questions? All right, well, let me give you a takeaway, just so you don't, uh, don't lose track of the forest for the trees here. So um, what was all this about? The, the, we have an actual problem of designing a real market. This uh, problem brings together economic and engineering aspects. It's part of a very important public policy program. We care about this infrastructure for the 21st century. How are we going to provide the infrastructure to have broadband available to the whole population, the Internet of Things, uh, uh, the, all the things that the, that the Internet and mobile communications will, will provide. We need to create uh, a capacity for that. We need to create capacity for that by taking uh, some spectrum out of old uses and moving it into new uses. And in terms of big public policy, this is part of that. The, uh, the problem of making a market actually work uh, doesn't work the way it tells you in the standard textbooks uh, because the, the products are not homogeneous. I was speculating in the first part of this talk about non-homogeneity. About the, In this case, the, we're trying to buy TV broadcast spectrum People tend to think of that as one thing, but actually every TV broadcaster is different. It has a different interference constraint. It sits somewhere else in the graph. It creates a, every TV broadcaster has unique characteristics, and we're trying to find a price price based system to guide that resource allocation. So the what's novel here is the need to uh, combine economic ideas about finding market clearing with uh, engineering ideas that basically create something that's actually feasible that we can really implement. What I showed you was a theory that says if you use greedy algorithms, you can find prices uh, that make it in the party's interest to behave truthfully, so make it simple for the bidders uh, to participate in the auction. Uh, and I've showed you that it actually also performs fairly well on, on a problem that's computationally very hard in terms of uh, delivering high levels of efficiency and low levels of cost. And uh, so that was the project. That, in summary, is what we think we've achieved. And uh, that's why this, this thing is a, is a pretty big deal in the, uh, in the world of market design. So since there were no questions, I, I thought I would just throw on my own conclusion for you and give you a sense of, of what it is we, we were trying to achieve and what we think we've done. So thanks again.